St. George's Day is coming. We could talk about a lot of other things, but we like books and roses, so there will be the cornerstone of today's The Weekly Mag. Journalist Antoni Vases and writers Najat El Hachmi and Mario Serra are here with their newly published books. We're interviewing a man who has photographed the front line of fame for over six decades, from presidents to pop stars. And Matthew Tree is facing off editor Patricia Scalona about San Jordi's Day. Stick around and give your English a try with Marcella Tepol. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Mag. Next Monday we are going to celebrate San Jordi's Day. And as you can see, we are already celebrating it in our set. It is our way of wishing you all a very good feast. Now let's keep your English running with some fun with Mark Broderick. Mark, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. How are you? How are you? Good? Not too I'm bad. Grand, I'm grand, no? This is uh, yes. how you say it. I'm in grand, Ireland, I'm right? grand, I'm grand. I'm a little bit like caught up with all of this whole St. Jordi thing. I'm a little bit confused. Why? Well, because in Valentine's Day, it's all about lovers, no? It's all about your partner, your wife, and etc. Whereas St. Jordi, everybody seems to give everybody a rose or a book, whether you work with them, family, etc. So mm -hmm. today I brought you in a rose and a book so that I wouldn't mess it up, you know? So here you go. Okay, that's There's very your kind rose. of you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I see you adopted the local tradition. I did indeed. And I got you a very special book as well. If really? You see the, the title? It's Spice Up Your Life. Oh. It's a little bit of an inside joke there. It's a Indian cookery book. Okay, exactly. Mm. So I've uh, bought you that and uh, hope you. That, uh, I hope that you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I love Indian food, so yeah, I'll, um, I'll uh, try to cook some recipes. Have you, um, have you tried any? I have indeed. It worked a treat with my wife. She loves really? Indian food. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the first time that San Jordi came around here, I compl completely forgot about the rose and I forgot about the book. And I tell you, I'll never forget again. I slept for one week on the couch and this book was a, re was a rescue for that. So I hope it brings you the same amount of luck. <laughs> well, okay. Um, let's see. Well, tell me, um, what happened um, this week? I know you went out with uh, Danny again. I did indeed, And you had yes. a few uh, adventures. We did. So um, what have you discovered? Uh, I asked one very simple question. How many dates will it take you to get into bed with somebody? Really? Yes. Well, that's a very deep and elegant, right? Exactly, just like me. <laughs> that's very, what you expect from me, A very me, no? direct uh, <laughs> question. Well, Mr. Stereotype uh, strikes again. Uh, let's see what he has for us uh, today. It's a romantic time of year. St. Jordi is coming up and I got to take my wife somewhere. I forgot to buy a rose. If I bring her on a boat, what do you think? Surprise, baby. Fuck. Oh. What kind of books do you like, sweetheart? Something erotic, maybe? Yeah, I was thinking of that too. Maybe a new version of Kama Sutra? <laughs> My wife saw some Fifty Shades of Mark. What would be your perfect date? Uh, just start with a flower at the beginning and a perfect and delicious meal. I'm not a complicated person, so, and now we have a child, so I'm just watching Netflix and having a glass of wine. <laughs> you make somebody laugh, that's it, you've got them. It doesn't matter in what form. It's making them smile, that's the hook. Maybe travel together. Something like today, we came from Girona today to visit the zoo, to see the animals. It's perfect here, actually. What's your perfect first date? I'm married. I don't need to go on dates anymore. How many dates do you have to go on someone before you sleep with them? 50. <laughs> <laughs> Is it always like that in the Philippines? Yes. The second day. The second day. <laughs> two, or th two or three. Two or, two or three. Yeah. Okay, so a ca typical Catalan, two or three dates, and then you can hop into bed. It's not always the same, but yeah, in this case. I think it depends on the person. Uh, so well, if he's hot, it's on the first night. Of course not. <laughs> uh, well, maybe six or ten, something like that. If Danny, excuse me because I'm married, <laughs> if Danny meets a Ukrainian girl, how many dates does he have to go on in order to get her into bed? Is Danny Spanish? Yes. Oh, uh, first date? Whew. My dad told me with love was exhausting. I didn't think it was this exhausting. Anyways, let's keep going. Instagram is the new Tinder? I would say yes, it's really easy to meet people through Instagram. Jesus, how did you meet Tania? Instagram. 
Instagram, number two. Could you describe to me the difference between dating somebody from your culture and another culture, if you have some experience with that? Their Portuguese people are a lot outgoing and they say what they think and they act on the way that they think mm -hmm. and maybe in a different culture that I may have dated. <laughs> Could you tell us which culture that is? British culture. So they keep everything to themselves and they may not speak or communicate as much. We have here a British man who I'm yeah. sure will argue against that, okay? That's pretty accurate, yeah. So you're complete, you're not actually going to defend that whatsoever? No. Hey. Oh, yeah. I'm sort of living, like, living, breathing, walking example of it, I imagine. A living, breathing, walking example of Britishness. My job here is to break down stereotypes and to prove that British people and Irish people are not like that. <laughs> and now you're, you're making my job very difficult here, Jack. A very romantic day here in Barcelona. I've come to two conclusions. One. It's not really what's on the outside that counts, it's what's on the inside. And two, in two dates, a foreigner can get into bed with most people. Hold on a minute, what about Instagram? My wife's on Instagram. Shit, Danny, we gotta go back. My wife's, my wife's on Instagram. Danny, how do you steer this thing? My wife did it so well. Oh, shit. Shit, shit, shit. God knows who she's talking to. Um, well, Mark, I must tell you that this isn't as bad as I originally thought. Hmm? Actually, it's a really nice video. Congratulations. It, thank you very much. It, uh, it was very difficult to do at the beginning, actually. Why was that? Because, I mean, like, I'm kind of uncomfortable with the whole, like, talking about people's love interests and how people interact with each other. You know, being Irish and us in Northern Europe as well, we're, we're quite closed, you know? We're, not, we're, we're afraid of, like, expressing our, our feelings and our opinions and things like this. So it was difficult at the beginning. Mm. Yeah. Well, it didn't seem to me, looking at the video, you seemed very um, comfortable. Well, uh, to tell you, the first couple of takes were a little bit like nervous, you know, I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what to ask the people, how far I could go, etc. You know that mm -hmm. in Ireland, in, in, in Northern Europe, we, we find like what they call PDA, like public displays of affection, right. something very uh, invasive. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful to see on the videos, you know, people holding hands, people kissing, uh, people giving each other kisses and stuff. I mean, in Ireland, that would be considered like quite uh, unhealthy, you know, passing bacteria and things. I think that's why they hold off on things. <laughs> <laughs> That's outrageous. Well, tell me, uh, tell me more about what, you, what did you find out um, uh, about uh, love and uh, relationships? Well, I found out, I found out basically that it, if you're a Catalan, you can probably jump into bed with a Ukrainian on your first date. However, if it's a Filipino, it will take you about 50 dates. Just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm giving you the exaggerated version of what really was. I mean, like, I found out that people like. Uh, in general, across all cultures, people love uh, a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have yeah. you heard, actually, have you heard the joke about the priest and the nun? No, I haven't. No? I'm, I'm not sure I want to hear it. You sure? Okay. Let's move oh, on. Try. Okay, Sorry. what else? Okay. Tell me something like uh, serious, because I'm serious. I'm, I'm talking seriously. You're serious? Yeah. Uh, I am serious. Uh, I mean, now I'm talking seriously. Ah, okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's imagine that we have uh, an Italian and uh, Italian couple that go for dinner. Okay. They, they have this very different way of interacting. It's all very sophisticated. They sit around with their coffee, their you know their macchiato or espresso. Mm -hmm. They have these deep, profound conversations. Okay. You know, this romantic is the very dinner. romantic dinner. You know, mm -hmm. with the ideas of Rome. Well, you can imagine like a British person, you know, the typical date they head out, they don't actually have a conversation until beer 24. You know, they drink about 24 beers and then it's not really a conversation, they just dive in and get, to, get down to it, if you catch my drift. Yeah, well, I'm sure everybody did. Um, okay, let's move on uh, again. What else uh, did you discover about relationships and about love? Well, and about romantic uh, relationships? Fair enough. The romantic, I have to be a little bit more romantic. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm sorry. this is San Jordi, come on. I know. It's the Captain San Valentine's. It, I get. It's not, it is, you know what, St. Valentine's Day for me, I lost interest in it many years ago because it got so uh, Americanized in a way. I know maybe I'm not really. Yes, but we're talking fair, about San Jordi, which is uh, very jo different. It it's is. The, it's the day of books and uh, the day of roses, no? It's about. Uh, but it's about, it's love about reading as well. and it's about, exactly, about love, about romantic love. I don't know, is it just about romantic love? I have to, I have to pick you up on that one. I think as well it's about the love you have uh, for, for other people in your life, not just the person that you, that you are. A red rose, in any case, that's, that means romance, right? Yes, that's mm -hmm. true, that's true. So, uh, have Let's you got see. Facebook? 
Uh, no. No, you don't. Well, I don't, use, I don't use it. Right. Okay, so Facebook is a really reliable source of information these days, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a, especially a website called lifehack.com. You, you have to believe them. For, with a name like Lifehack, well, it has of to that. be believable, okay? <laughs> so anyways, in lifehack.com, I, I researched some, you know, things about love in general, all right, so that we can uh, talk. So okay, number, number one, see. it said, all right, love is as addictive as cocaine or nicotine. Mm. That sounds terrible. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to the terrible part. Number two, love needs to be blind for survival. Okay, can it survive unless it's blind? Hmm. Number three, we are attracted to someone who smells or looks like our parents. We'll get back to that one in a minute. Number four, we tend to fall in love with someone who looks like ourselves. Really? Yes. And number five, love can literally make you go crazy. Okay, go. I see. Well, I don't know what to think about these uh, uh, these ideas. I mean, I, I'm a bit skeptical. Aren't You're a bit you? skeptical. Come on, yeah. let's let's go back to number three. We are attracted to someone who smells or looks like our parents. I mean, in, if that was the case, wouldn't Catalans be in love with a plate of like mongetas y putifarra? That's offensive. And, <laughs> and the Irish people would be in love with potatoes. I mean, that's an offensive stereotype. It, it is indeed, but if it, if it's written here, it must be true. And number four, we tend to fall in someone fall in love with someone who looks like ourselves. My wife what is say. small and Spanish. She doesn't look anything like me, so I don't think that number four is true. So I'm you should sure. um, have a more reliable uh, source of information, no? Next time you need to uh, do some more research, more serious research, maybe? The last one was <laughs> the one I loved the most. L love can literally make you go crazy. I liked this one, and I think mm -hmm. it's true as well. Yeah, because we must be. Are you crazy? Uh, I am, because, but I think the program in general is a little bit crazy. I mean, why would they have an Irish guy talking about love with you? They should have some like Italian or French or Catalan poet talking to you about love and beauty. I mean, all of the people here must be crazy and to put me on oh, this come show. on, we're not crazy here in the Weekly Mag. Come on. A little bit. A well, little bit. Um, anyway, uh, Mark, thank you so much for no coming today and with all this valuable information. Thank you for Va valuable, yeah? uh, enlighten uh, enlightening us. Uh, again, um, I'll see you next week. Yes, indeed you will. Uh, with uh, another video, uh, same time, same, same time, place. same place. Okay, exactly. take care. Thank you very much. And now it's time for our tips with our friends from International House Barcelona. Love. Love is everywhere. Well, maybe not between fans of Real Madrid and Barca, but almost everywhere. So let's talk about the different types of love today. The first word is affection. Now, affection is a warm feeling you have towards someone, but it's not romantic. So you can have affection towards your friends. You can have affection towards the woman who sells you fish at the market. You can even have affection towards your colleagues. But let's say there's one special colleague that you start to like in a romantic way. You can say you have a crush on that person. Now, every time you see them in the office, you have a special sensation right here. They give you butterflies in your stomach. Well, not literally. That would be rather uncomfortable. But one day you find yourself in an elevator looking right in this person's eyes and you realize there's a spark between you. That means there's a mutual attraction, you both like each other, and you start dating. So after a few dates, you really like this person, and you want to get to know them in a more physical way. You can say, you have the hots for someone. So if you say you have the hots for someone, it's a slang expression that we use to say you have a strong physical desire for them. Now, after a few in close counters, you realize that there's something between you. You can say you've come into a moment of passion. The feelings of love have gotten deeper and your physical chemistry is great. Unfortunately, passion doesn't always last, but if it does, you can say you've fallen head over heels with this person. So you're crazy in love. They're the first thing you think of when you wake up and the last person you want to see when you go to sleep. Now, 
After a few months of dating, you realize you adore this person. So you're feeling adoration. Now, adoration is a very strong love. It's almost like a religious experience. But be careful though. Love can make you do crazy things. So until next time, see ya. Our guests today have a few things in common. They write for the media, their books have won awards, and they'll spend the whole day signing books during the next San Jordi. Antoni Bassas is a journalist from Barcelona, and this year he presents his new book entitled Bon Dia, Son Les Vuit. Najat El Ajmi was born in Nador, in Morocco. She's a writer, and this year she publishes Mara Daliet Imel. And Mario Serra was born in Barcelona. Apart from being a writer, he's also one of the most amazing word players in our country. And it's his second visit to this show. We will talk to them in a minute, but before, I suggest you pay attention to this glossary. First word to listen carefully to, review. It means the critical article often in a newspaper or magazine about a book, a play or a movie. Second concept you need to know, publisher. It is the person or company whose business is the publishing of books. That means the one who issues them for sale or distribution to the public. And last but not least, and very important to keep in mind, the difference between library and bookshop or bookstore. Library is a false friend for Catalan speakers. The library is the place containing books or other reading materials, arranged and catalogued in a fixed way. You can usually borrow books there, but remember to give them back on time. So, where can you buy books if the library isn't the proper place? You can buy the latest bestseller in a bookshop or bookstore. These words will appear throughout the interview, so stay tuned. Well, uh, Antoni Bassas, Najat El Achmi, Mario Serra, welcome to the Weekly Mag. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much for inviting us. Well, you're here to talk about uh, your books, the books that you're going to, uh, to present this year for San Jordi. We start with uh, Najat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, your book, uh, Najat, uh, is about uh, Fatima, who is forced to leave Morocco and emigrate to, uh, to Catalonia. Tell me how much of this uh, book um, is, um, has been inspired by your life? By your mother and yourself. Yeah, I I think every uh, writer writes about the things um, they know. So, of course. Um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly which part of the book is um, about the things I know and which part is just invention. Mm -hmm. But um, I I wanted to you know to give uh, a voice to uh, so many women that I met. Um, when I was young, women I grew up with uh, in, in the north of Morocco. Yes. How old were you when you came to Catalonia? Uh, I was eight years old, um, but before that I, you know, I spent the first eight years uh, with, in, a, in a house with a lot of women. I mean, my father has um, seven sisters and my mother has six sisters, so wow. <laughs> it's... Um, and the good thing is they they were telling stories all the time about themselves, about things that happened in the family, about things that happened to someone else. So um, I used to listen very carefully uh, to them, you know, and, um, and because it, this area I grew up in is, is, is also a very hard place. I mean, um, life which, there was... Which part of Morocco is it's it? It's the Reef, it's in the north, and um, but it was a very small town and um, we were quite, you know, disconnected uh, from other places. So, um, yeah, in, in that place, um, oral literature is very important, so... I think so I learned. Had, yes. <laughs> quite, I learned... Uh, so you, you know, also went through the same process as Fatima, no? In a way, a new country, a no, new culture. Exactly, because she's a mother, and I was a do I, I was uh, uh, very young when I mm -hmm. came here. I think the experience is different. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for us, it was easier because we, you know, we we went to school very um, many, very soon. We learned the language. We had, you know, so many tools to um, integrate or to to be part of this society. Mm -hmm. 
But for our mothers, it was very difficult because they didn't speak the language. And the age is also important, right? Yeah, they it's were more adults. difficult to adapt. Yeah, mm. they were adults when they immigrated and, and they used to stay at home. So it was, everything was very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Tony, let's talk about uh, your book, Bon Dia Son Las Vuit. Uh, it's um, a review of your career. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, Almatida Catalunya Radio. Um, radio program which made history, right? And Thank you, you. <laughs> and um, you are in front of it for over a decade. Yeah. Mm? Uh, Tell us about it's, the book. It's a, it's a, it's a book of memories. Um, the years I, I spent uh, broadcasting the most important uh, uh, radio uh, show in the morning, uh, and yes, that provides me a, a, a very extensive. Um, sort of experiences, especially with politics, but also with people of culture like Nayat or, or Marius. Marius uh, <laughs> worked with, with me uh, doing his crosswords every day uh, for right. the listeners. Uh, uh, it, it, the, the idea was born at that time yep, in 2006 or, or five. Huh? In 26, I Ten. think. 2006, yeah. So, yes, um, I tried to explain to explain in, in that book my experiences, um, but also um, the, 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 uh, I think that, that we can say that the history of, of the country, um, exactly. because you can review all things um, related to uh, Jordi Pujol and the end of his presidency, uh, the first government with Maragall uh, and then Montilla, but also the changes in Spain, in Spain, Felipe González, José María Aznar, uh, José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero, um, uh, the, the, the changes we experience that uh, I think for sure that bring us to, this, to the present. I mean, right. if you want to understand what, what's going on in Catalonia right now, you can go back to these years and you will understand where are the roots of, the, of all, the, all, all these changes we witnessed during these years. Mm -hmm. Very interesting indeed. You also talk about your uh, experience as a correspondent, a, a ah, yes. US correspondent, right? This is so a bonus track, the last chapter of the book, <laughs> uh, a, a sort of bonus track. Yes, I, I explain my um, four years in, in Washington DC as a correspondent of the television of Catalonia, along with my family. And um, the, well, of, of, of sort of, of experiences we, we, we live through there. Yeah. We can talk about uh, that a little bit later because I want to ask uh, Marius about uh, his book La Novela de San Jordi, uh, which is a parody. Um, uh, it's full of black humor. It is uh, your first crime novel and it's uh, also a satire uh, of uh, the whole literary world. Yes, in fact, it's a sort of love declaration for San Jordi, yeah. which is a very big feast, literary feast, which all people from all over the world come here and think, oh, these Catalan people are fond of books. They are reading all the day. Yeah. And we have to say it's only one day <laughs> in all the year. Yeah. But um, I, I felt I could write about it because uh, it's been 30 years uh, ago that I started to go there signing books. So mm, I took a crime novel as a vehicle to talk about literature, about this country, about people and about um, high culture versus popular culture, which I think in the end is the theme of this book with so many writers being killed. Exactly. <laughs> That's, um, I just wanted to ask you, um, in the book you kill, yeah. right? Um, popular, well-known Catalan writers, uh, we're talking about Pilar Aola <laughs> and uh, people uh, like uh, Carlos Ruiz Zafón. What, what was their reaction when they found out about the fact that you well, killed them in the book? I, and Javier Cercas as well. I, really? I, I must admit, yeah. But, but the thing is that th this is in the novel, there is an author who kills all these uh, best-selling authors in, in a novel called Eleusis in San Jordi. This author, by the way, is called Mario Serra, but it's not yes. me, it's an author inside the novel, right? I see. And then all these people, 
especially Pilar Raola, is alive afterward. <laughs> and yes. they are reacting. Yeah, absolutely. They are reacting to this sort of black humor in different ways, which are quite parodically. I am an auto parodic uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I am there. Uh, and the thing is that this seems to be premonitory, so that this novel there uh, then comes to uh, to reality, but all these new authors who are dying in the new novel are not with a uh, surname. I mean, are invented. So no one else yes. um, is upset with you mm. in any way, right? I, I don't so think far. so. So far, so far. I, I must admit, uh, I have to meet Pilar Raola in a radio station uh, in one of these days, and I'm quite ashamed. But uh, she was my first uh, uh, publisher, in fact, 32 years ago, and we have a very good relationship. I, I think she won't be uh, surprised about this. Okay, Marius. Well, we'll talk about uh, the book about, and about San Jordi later. Okay. Um, San Jordi's day is approaching and with it the feast of books and love in Catalonia. We'll keep talking about books, writing and reading. Our special collaborator Tony Garcia will be with us in a minute. But we have to take a short break now. During this break, you can take the opportunity to think a little about the words of the great guitarist Jimi Hendrix about love. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hello again. We're back in the weekly mag. Today we're talking about books, love and of course San Jordi's Day. And we're doing it with journalists Antoni Vassas and writers Najat El Hashmi and Mario Serra. And since we're talking about culture and books, we have also invited our collaborator Tony Garcia to join us. Tony, welcome to the Weekly Map. Thank you very much. For the first time. You're here for Thank the first time. Thank you very time. much. Hope not the last one. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. So um, uh, we hate to talk about books uh, and reading uh, and San Jordi. I know you you have some um, curiosities to tell. Yes, um, I want to talk about a very strange competitive thing that is going on around the world of books between two libraries. It's not publishers or writers. It's, it's uh, the the uh, library of uh, the Congress in in Washington. I guess Antoni knows. Maybe it's that. that Many times. No, well, no, no, well, it's, it's free. It's, it's, you, it's a public you can place, go and you can, and you can it. visit it. It's yeah. an amazing place. If it's free, that's if great. It's free, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> As yeah. a Catalan, I'm proud yeah. that it's free. Yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. And and it, they hold like 162 million references, and they they always say they are the first one in the world. Among them, uh, a Bible of Gutenberg. Exactly. For example. But at the other side of the Atlantic, there's this other library, the one in in London, the British. Oh. I've been there. Exactly, and they, they say they are the first one. And they have this, you know, this thing going on. And they say they have 170 million books, so, so it's 8 million more than the other ones. But the other one says, we are the first ones. So I like to see this fight between them because it's a, it's a good fight, because it's impossible to check who is the first one, you know, because at least you go there and count one by one all the references, which probably, with the, the quantity of books and documents they have, it would take like one or two lives. It would be impossible to know. So I would like to ask you guys, what's your favorite library in the world? Mm, good question. Marius? I, I used to, uh, to be a, a, a visitor of this British library when I was uh, writing about Bervalia, uh, the last century, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> in the 90s. So I had my... Uh, I ID and I went there and it was uh, absolutely impressive. Yes. So I would say British this one. Yeah. British one. Yeah. Um, I I remember a lot the first library I went to because uh, it's something that was very new for us. When I was uh, a child, it, I mean it, I was eight or nine maybe. We went with school uh, to visit the library uh, in Bic. And um, something that's 
so uh, normal in, in other places. It was so fascinating for me because they told me that there was a place full of books that you can read for fee and then you can take them at home as well. So uh, I found that, uh, well, a wonderful place. And I, since then I spent, um, you know, uh, all the time I could in, in that library. Which, which is closed now because uh, they built another one bigger and very beautiful, but... Um, and in, in your first book, in L'Ultim Patriarca, yeah. uh, one of the characters uh, takes refugee in the... Oh, really? In, in the library. <laughs> I was impressed by that. Don't well, the, the daughter, the daughter yeah, in the novel this, is always in yeah, the library. In my, library. In my novels, there's always... Um, you know, a girl reading a lot in libraries, but that one was wonderful. It was quite old. I mean, it was the Jaume Balmes library. And um, there was still this, I don't know the name in English, but this, these cards for features, features in, the, in a, you know, and um, I, I remember that one. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the best uh, library in the world, but, but it, it's was, a special it was, it's very yes. special for me. It's, it's my library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tony? My first memory of a library is in, in my neighborhood in Gracia, uh, El Carrer Major de Gracia. It was in a um, library of La Caixa at that time, uh, many, many libraries many in, in, in the country. Uh, but, um, I mean, for, forgive me for my snob comment, but uh, <laughs> I spent in 2007 uh, 15 days studying English in New York. And I. Yeah, and, and I, and I spent many, many, uh, yeah, many, many hours in the public library in the Fifth Avenue. Yes. The, the one that appears in, in many series and films. Uh, Sex and the City, for example, there is an, a, 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 a scene with an, um, the marriage of, the, of one of the, the actresses. That's my favorite, too. I think the, the one it's in magnificent. New York, yeah. the public one is a... The cultural problem I was about to say a bad word. It's F amazing. F yeah. amazing. F amazing. Four letters. I agree word. on that. So I have a little test for you guys. Do you know which are the two the two best selling books in history? The Bible. Bible. The Bible. Or the Quran. <laughs> or the Quran. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Um, no. Um, Harry oh. Potter. Maybe? No. <laughs> Anyone? I don't know. Okay, and in fiction, I would say the Bible is fiction, but I don't want. Anyone Part of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the name of the rose? No, Quishot, maybe? No. An equal, no. <laughs> yeah, the, the Quixote. Oh. The Quixote ah, is right. the first one. And the second one, you would never know. Mm. Uh, give us, give us um, a, clue a clue or clue. something. It's Dickens, Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens? Mm. That's Oliver the Chris? second one. Which one? Tale of Two Cities. Oh, oh. Tale of Two Cities. Right. I didn't know. Someone put it here for me. <laughs> <laughs> Dickens himself. <laughs> so let me talk now about uh, bookshops, which is one of my favorite subjects ever. I think bookshops are amazing. It seems that in Barcelona, you know, they are, yeah, the Barcelona ones are amazing. But um, I would like to ask you about the, your favorite ones that are not in Barcelona. Mm. Barnes okay. & Noble in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, the, 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 it, it was a, a bookshop where I found um, uh, Queen Sophia. Oh, yeah. Uh, ah, in a yeah. bookshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, b buying books uh, for I think that for for, for children. I mean, uh, this this sort of literature. Actually, mm. this scene you you tell it you write about it in your book. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it was uh, it it was shocking because I saw. Uh, four or five men, black tie, uh, big Police shoulders, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I thought, who are these, these, these men here? And then I, I, I turned left or right and, and I saw the, the queen with a sort of basket putting, <laughs> no, the, the basket was in the hands of one of these men and, and she, she oh, put the, books, the, yeah. the books uh, in the basket and then she ever. paid, I saw that. Who, paid, the paid. men or she? No, she. she. He yeah. was paying personally? Yes. But it was his money, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> you I, I can say it. You I don't know. 
Your well, favorite one? I, I would say lots of them, and one of these in Catalonia, not in Barcelona, Las Pulsada, in Las Franqueses del Vallès. But I, I, I would uh, go to, uh, I, I was thinking about uh, some in the, in the foreign uh, library and, or bookshop, and uh, I think in Wales there is a whole village called Hay on Wai. I, oh, I, yes. oh yes, I, yes, yes, yes. Literature, literature festival. Yeah, but the, amazing the, one. The, yeah, I was there uh, for a week, because they, the, there are maybe thirty different bookshops. One of them in a castle, in an old castle, which are secondhand book. Yes. Uh, and I uh, found there even cat, uh, books in Catalan. I mean, mm, it's a sort of special village which now is a sort of a touristic attraction. Yeah. But you, you've got uh, bookshops only with poetry, uh, bookshops only about Dickens, Dickens Sammy, and uh, that, that's like paradise. I know they me. have a music festival there and a film festival. Yeah. First it was only literature, and now it's everything. It's art, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, again, I used to go to a, live, uh, to a bookshop in, in, in Bic. <laughs> La Tralla. Uh, yeah. No, La Tralla, uh, it was one of my favorites, when, but next to this uh, library, there was another one, which was Mots. Ah, Mots. Uh, a small one, but um, they had a lot of interesting books that I couldn't buy. I mean, I was all the time visiting the, the bookshop and just you know, uh, <laughs> reading a little bit of, of the books uh, that were that were in, in the um, in the library, but now this bookshop is closed because the uh, the owners I think they are retired. But in Big, which is not a very very big uh, city, they told me that they, there are um, eighteen libraries or something and bookshops. oh sorry bookshops. Yeah, yeah, yeah bookshops. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's 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 a lot for that's, yeah, that's pretty amazing. In, because it's a student city by now. A, yeah. a, a university uh, gets a lot of young people uh, buying books. Uh, yeah, <laughs> then when they grow up, they but stop I, buying. I think for yeah. um, forty thousand people. I mean, it's 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 good. It's a lot. You didn't ask me. Can I answer as Priscilla, well? Priscilla, please. <laughs> okay, Let thank me you. know. Well, um, one in Paris, Shakespeare and Company. Okay. Oh. Uh, that's, that's a, a classic. One. It's a classic, classic right? And uh, well, I know you said um, uh, a bookshop uh, which is not in Catalonia, but I really would like to mention one in I said Girona. Barcelona. Barcelona. Not in so Barcelona. Not in Barcelona. Okay, sorry. So, so one in Girona called okay. Libraria Geli on La Rambla, yes. which is really it's an amazing place. Uh, you can find anything there, so I really recommend it. I interviewed, well. I interviewed a guy, that's a, that's a story, I think a good one. I interviewed a guy years ago in Brixton, it's a, it's a neighborhood in London, in London, and there was a riot there and they just crashed the whole, you know, the whole neighborhood. There was only one shop they didn't touch, it was a bookshop. And the guy told me, I, I'm sad they didn't break in and, you know, <laughs> Still some books, so <laughs> they could learn something. They weren't and interested. It's in an books. amazing one. They stole TV sets. And yeah, they uh, stole everything, but, but no but books. No books. No books. No books. Uh, well, Tony, let's talk about San Jordi, right? Yes. Hmm? I was going to ask our guests uh, about this really special day. How do you prepare for it? What expectations you have for this year? Hmm? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I'm taking a lot of vitamins. And <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it is a very stressful time You're when you have a new Vic? book. Are you going no, to be in no, Vic? I'm. I'm always in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when you have a new book, uh, it is a very, very stressful day. Um, you need to exercise your hand. Yeah, <laughs> and going, you know, from um, from, from a place to place, place, to place yeah. all the time. And the uh, streets are very crowded, and you're always late everywhere. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's um, there are a lot of parties as well, and um, you know you've been in a party the day before, and then you have to do a lot of uh, <laughs> and always the same faces. Yeah, but I mean the problem is not that the problem is you're very very tired. Of and um, uh, Mario said that this is a um, you know literary fest, and uh, once I understood that it wasn't literary fest, it was a book fest. Yeah, of course, of course. Because you can buy a book. But that, that doesn't gonna mean you're going to read it. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, and there's a, you know, so there's, it's a commercial. yeah, because there's, a, there are some, you know, strange phenomena. And uh, one day there was a huge queue 
next to me and I asked, who's signing here? And it was a YouTuber or something. And it was, yeah. <laughs> who's that? Or what, what's or that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but right. the, the, but it's there's, funny. There's um, space for everybody. I mean, I mean, it's, no, it, no, it's I'm a not commercial. Complaining. It's I'm a not commercial complaining feast at all. Because yeah. uh, its origin is in 1926. And it was a, a, a sort of uh, mm, a commercial thing by a Valencian publisher called Clavel. Uh, which uh, it's uh, always for me uh, like a joke because you are going to give roses, not <laughs> not clavel. <laughs> but uh, he was a Valencian one, and he wanted to just to sell books, mm, right? No, that's okay. But in all this space, you've got, for instance, poets and little uh, publishing houses as well. It's uh, about two a million people in Barcelona that day going. Yeah, my my uh, expectation is uh, enjoying this day. Uh, although I'm not a uh, professional writer of books, uh, um, so it's uh, maybe my, my, my only opportunity to, to, to live the, this day um, in the other part of the, of the table as, as a writer signing. But uh, I realized those days during the, the promotion of the, of the book in, in Catalonia that uh, things are, uh, are, are being complicated. Uh, because you have to sign the, the book, but then you have to, to make the, a selfie. Yeah. the selfie, selfie. Yeah. And, and that the process is, is being um, <laughs> more and video, more complicated. They, even and a video, video set, saying and, hello to somebody. And or can you record an, an, an out of voice for my <laughs> grandmother or yeah. something? And, and yeah. yeah, and so <laughs> we have to uh, um, adopt uh, strategies in order to an upper fame. To survive. Yeah, to survive, <laughs> to yes. Survive. And smile all the Every time. Smile all the time, time. Right? I like have the, 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 the just word for, for everybody. Yeah. And um, pretending you are very, well, no, well, uh, <laughs> you are very interesting in everything they say. The one, one thing, uh, if you, uh, uh, some people will give to you his book. Yeah, sure. <laughs> when no, no. Every single San Jordi I come back to That happened with to me, yes. Books, right? Twice. Twice. Twice, right? twice during these two last book, uh, weeks. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, yeah, I think the problem maybe it's it's people expect to 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 talk to the, the writers and it's not a day to have a conversation because there's no time for that. And the best place for that is the book clubs. Right. Well, well, there you can you can speak about literature, about your process and all that. And Antonio, you also spent San Jordi in the US, I guess, no? Yes. Hmm? How was it different there? Well, there is no San Jordi. <laughs> no, but then there is uh, uh, something, uh, no? no? Catalan. Organized, yeah, the, the, no? The, 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 the Catalan Casal in Washington DC organized uh, a San Jordi. Um, and then, uh, yes, but mostly it was uh, conferences in uh, uh, Georgetown University about Catalonia, politics, right. everything, and then some exhibition of, of, of books and, and uh, Catalan books, but uh, uh, was mostly an, uh, an a party of um, sad Catalans for being uh, uh, <laughs> overseas in, in that important day. I see. I see. Right. Um, you all have very good uh, English, um, and um, well, Marius, uh, furthermore, he uh, does more than that. He also translates uh, English books into Catalan and Spanish. Um, I would like to ask you to listen to the following tips, because later we are going to talk about them. OK, so you're in love and it's a wonderful feeling. But you don't want to keep repeating the same sentence, I love you, I love you, I love you, when there's many different ways that you can express your love for someone. You might say, you mean the world to me. This is a way of saying, my love for you is as big as the world, it's massive. Or maybe, you stole my heart. Now, of course, this doesn't mean someone has stolen and ripped out your heart, but it means that that person is the all you can think about. Now, a warning, this is a little bit of a cheesy one. Maybe you'll say, you are the apple of my eye. This means that's the one person that you love the most and that you're really proud of them. Or another cheesy one, maybe you want to say, you are my angel, that you think this person is fantastic and also really beautiful. Or maybe you are my sunshine. This means that person lights up your life and makes you really happy. Maybe you've met one person that you think, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. You could say, you are the one. 
the one person out of everyone in the world for me. And if you're in a bit of a rush, you want to summarize all of these, you could just say, you are my everything. But be careful about saying the, all of these in one go. You might come on a little bit strong and you might sound a bit like Enrique Iglesias. See you. Well, so let's talk about love. San Jordi uh, is not just about books, it's also about uh, love, about romance. So uh, tell me if you've ever used any of these expressions. No. No? <laughs> I well, don't remember. Well, <laughs> tell us, tell me then which ones um, uh, have you used? I mean, uh, some expressions um, we can use to talk about love without being too cheesy or too predictable. Um. Man first. <laughs> man, man first. Okay. okay. All, all these, uh, all these seem uh, from uh, laugh songs, which are quite cheesy mm, by definition. But I think people um, uses very in the intimacy. In intimacy, uh, I think they are going to subtitle me. So intimacy, <laughs> not intimacy. Uh, okay. Mm, like uh, in Catalan, I said, "Vols que mardem les coses." Oh, this is one of my favorites. That's not love, that's <laughs> another thing. Well, I used that. We're talking about <laughs> love and romance, right? Well, romance, love uh, means well, uh, getting in involved and amarda. Which has is, a, a which good let's put it this way. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, uh, songs are a powerful source yes, of uh, ideas of course, for yeah. that, no? I'm recalling, for example, All You Need Is Love. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you say that to a girl, <laughs> she's gonna say, <laughs> La, la, well, la, la, la. You, 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 you don't know. <laughs> Olaf is in the air, everywhere and look around, for example. Let's put it this way, which is the most romantic, romantic thing you've ever said? Um, Najat. I, me, because I've been thinking about identity all my life, because I'm a uh, daughter of immigrants. Right. And I'm always asking myself, uh, where do I be belong to? Uh, when I discovered love, real love, <laughs> I... I, I feel this, I mean, it's not something that I normally say, but I felt that uh, you, um, you are the place I belong to. Right. You mm, are that's very, to. that's, that's nice. lovely. Because I think uh, at the end, um, if you feel like you belong to a place, it's because you have uh, people there that you love. I mean, you belong to the people you love and that love you, <laughs> love you. Mm -hmm. I think that the most romantic thing I ever said was at 3 uh, a.m. in the morning. With a gin tonic? No, at bed, no, uh, ah, in the bed, in the yeah, bed. Uh, with my wife. And, um, well, uh, we heard our <laughs> son crying and I said, uh, I I'll take that. Oh. I think it's uh, the, the, the proof of love. That's, most that's important. real love. I, 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 that's I, I, real I could love. do. That's Absolutely. real love. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, but she gave birth. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good point. There's a, there's a separation of, of powers and, uh, at home, and <laughs> yes. That's important. That's, 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 yeah. Okay. What about you, Tony? Um, I would say home is wherever you are. <laughs> I just said that once, and it was an epic failure. But I tried. <laughs> I tried anyway. Try again, try. <laughs> home, sit home. Yes. Okay, um, right, before we um, finish uh, this conversation about San Jordi, about uh, books and love, you're all uh, writers here, right? Tell me a little bit about um, uh, your writing habits. What kind of uh, writers you are when you write and where you find your inspirations, if you uh, write every day and so on? Well, I, I write uh, daily in, in, the, in our newspaper, but then at, at home, um, I'll write uh, almost every day uh, uh, an, an easy recall of, of the day, uh, so a diary, and, um, and, and that keeps me uh, trying to think and, and the, 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 the things I live through and, uh, and what things that impact my daily life and trying to, to put that in, a, in, in, the, in the most uh, literate Literally, way possible. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you couldn't have written uh, your book, right? For Without sure. keeping a daily diary, I suppose. No, well, n not only for for the yeah, yeah, but yes, uh, that uh, was uh, very helpful for me. Uh, and Najat? Yeah, uh, for me, there's uh, two different 
things to write. Uh, there is fiction and there is um, non-fiction, which is articles or other other things that I write. And um, for fiction, I need to write very early in the morning, very very early in the morning. I mean, what does that mean? That means what time? five in the morning, five a.m. or six. But I don't do it every day. I mean. Uh, to write a novel, I think about it a lot, you know, uh, so many months or even years, and then uh, there's one point that uh, it's, it's oh, everything is ready, so right. that's the time I start to wake up very early in the morning, and uh, because I need to be more connected with something that's um, in a very uh, deep place in my memory or something, and uh, I can do that uh, in the morning, not uh, in, okay. in, uh, in... And when that clicks, you can start uh, the actual process of writing. Yeah, yeah. And for, for non-fiction articles or, or other things, uh, I can write. That's I, easier, yeah, no? that's, right? That's more yeah, mechanical. I, it's something that I have to think, not something that I have to feel. Uh, to write fiction, I need to feel what's going on in, in the book. That's an interesting point. Ni Marius? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I have two sort of uh, writing habits, uh, an open-handed and a close-handed. I mean, open-handed writing is for me uh, uh, crosswords or articles. I write uh, through the PC, my, my computer, and in a very uh, working uh, position at home and uh, very quickly. But then when I write literature, about, uh, apart from thinking about it maybe months or you never know because uh, an idea or a feeling is growing inside. And then uh, I always go uh, with handwriting and which is uh, slower and uh, maybe it's not so uh, easy. Uh, uh, than the, the, my, my computer and of course um, when I am in a project uh, I, maybe I write but not in the morning or at night um, e everywhere and uh, especially in the train in the train or in movement is very nice for me right. with music and, and writing but that's when I am writing a novel or some fiction in that period uh, if not, maybe I'm just thinking about it, maybe writing down some notes, but it's not uh, the real moment of passion that I need to write fiction. All right. We've got uh, here three writers and three different ways of writing. Well, um, we cannot finish uh, this uh, conversation about San Jordi, about books uh, and reading um, without a gift, right? I think you all deserve it. Oh. Right, so the gift is a book, of course. So let's see, I've got here Marius Serra's book for Najat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Najat's book for Tony. Wow, thank you. Right, and uh, Tony Bassas for Marius. Thank you very much. Can I take a selfie with you? <laughs> then you Ma maybe well, I, I would need uh, uh, a message. No problem. <laughs> a video message, okay? I'll do that. Okay. Well, I hope you all enjoy them. Thank you so much for coming to the Weekly Mag. And good luck um, of, for San Jordi. I hope you sell lots of books, right? And I hope you have a great day. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Tony, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> to the back. first Weekly Mag. Thank you. It's time for our Portrait of the Week. Today we present a video of a photographer who dedicated part of his life to portraying show business artists. He lives in England but exhibits his work at the Filmoteca de Catalunya until May 13. Terry O'Neill is considered one of the great names in British photography and uh, we have had the opportunity to talk to him. This is his portrait. My name's Terry O'Neill. I took all these photographs. I was employed to go on films for two weeks to get pictures for them to publish in magazines. And that meant I spent two weeks roughly with each star, which was a great way to get to know them. The first couple of years I used to tell people I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't. 
I just pointed a camera and pressed the button. And I guess I've learned something on the way, but I couldn't explain to you what it is. When I look back at all this work, I, I, you know, sometimes I think, when did I do all this? You know, it just doesn't seem possible. It was the most creative time and young people were given a chance and we took it. You know, we all helped each other. It was an incredible time, the 60s. Two men who stood out out of all the people I photographed. And one was Frank Sinatra because he was a story in himself. And the other was Nelson Mandela, who, who I realized was a truly wonderful man. And Amy Winehouse was one of the last people I photographed who I really thought was going to be a big jazz singer. She was just one of those unfortunate people killed by drugs. I mean, I've always been against drugs ever since the 60s because they're the most invidious, sickest way of killing yourself of all. It's a joke. It's an awful, awful way to go. I find the whole world of show business boring now. There's no one I want to photograph anymore. There's nobody I really want to, even singers. There's no nobody. So I don't know what's going to happen. I'd rather be lonely than without a voice. I'd rather be a stranger than your broken toy. These words were written by Stephen Munar and they are a good example of this artist's determination to make his own music. Pop, folk, uh, country, rock, he says he likes all kinds of music as long as it's made right. And it's precisely that, to make it right, is what Stephen Munar has tried to do throughout his long uh, discography. He was born in Palma, uh, in Mallorca, but uh, he has been living in Barcelona since 1995. He's played with bands like the Tea Servants, the Coffee Masters, the Lunatics, and the Miracle Band. And a few months ago, he presented his latest song uh, collection entitled Violet Koski. Steven Munar, thank you so much for coming. Thanks. <laughs> I pronounced your surname correctly, right? It was perfectly pronounced. <laughs> well, um, uh, Stephen, what is Violet Koski? Um, what does it uh, represent? Violet Koski is the name that my mother gave to her mother or in, a, in a short story she did when she passed away. So your mother was a, a writer? My mother's a writer, she Mama, likes... Your mom is a writer, sorry. Is a writer, yes. yes. She likes writing short stories and poems. And as I was telling you, uh, my grandmother passed away and I thought it was a very nice name to dedicate to her, you know, like an honour. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, your uh, family is uh, quite present in your music. True. Right? Yes. Tell me about it. Well, um, in this last record, in Violet Koski, there are many songs which are dedicated to different members of my, my family, mm -hmm. you know, my daughter. I always write a song for my daughter, you know, since she was born. And I like writing, you know, to see how, uh, what I, the way I see her, the way she grows up, you know, mm -hmm. this kind how of thing. How old is she? She's 11 now. And also there is a song dedicated to, to my father. Uh, which is a kind of a redemption song, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and also to 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 my grandmother, and you know, yes, it's quite pleasant, but it's not it's not the only stuff that I sing about. Mm -hmm. um, you also uh, have an uh, album dedicated to children, uh, true, right? True, true. I'm also a teacher, an English teacher, and I teach to children, and I like mixing, you know, my my own songs with uh, the 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 things we talk in that day, you know, for if we're mm -hmm. talking about animals, so uh, we do a song about animals, mm -hmm. so uh, on. Let's go back to Violet Koski. Right. Uh, originally, originally, it was supposed to include 18 songs. True. And then you decided to, um, uh, to have less uh, songs in it. Uh, yeah. I think the, it's now uh, it's 14, 14 songs, songs right? Yeah. Yeah. So what determined you to, um, to decide that? Well, we were having a conversation in our family, uh, my wife and my daughter, and it came up that 
18 songs were too many, you know? And my daughter was telling me, nobody listens to 18 songs nowadays, so, so why don't you reduce it? Why didn't you make one of 10? And I thought, well, and that's, yeah, I don't like the idea. I wanted to do a double album, like the kind of the Beatles or things like this, you know? And finally, I decided just to put 14 in it. Mm -hmm. It was a good choice. Um, uh, you, um, uh, you write in English, your songs uh, yeah. are uh, in English, but you live here. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, uh, about that. I mean, uh, how come that the, the, the music comes to you in English? Well, I suppose it's my mother's influence and my British influence. No? All the music that I heard when I was a child was all the American and English music from that time. Beatles or Bob Dylan or Pink Floyd. So I suppose this has a heavy influence on me, you know. And I've always written my lyrics in English, in English. So it's something that it comes out a bit easier than do, to do it in another language. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, your style has been described um, uh, like a very eclectic, a combination of different uh, different styles. Um, um, uh, related to the music of the 70s as yeah. well. How would you describe your style in a few words? Well, I suppose my latest LP, it's quite 70s, no, and 80s. I think I've opened a bit, <laughs> no, but yeah, I've been through many different styles over my career, no. I played some folk and even country rock music. Uh, uh, in the beginning, I was very, very into the after, British after punk, but mm, yes, nowadays I suppose it's more the 70s, 80s vibe. Mm -hmm. I see. Let's talk a little bit about um, how um, your music has evolved since, your, since you started. I think it yes. was in 1986. True. If, uh, if That's right. a long time ago. Right. <laughs> and um, how technology. Um, is uh, changing music and mm -hmm. the, the, the taste is of, uh, of the audience. Obviously, technology is changing everything. Not the way that I write my songs, because I write my songs with an acoustic guitar and singing, and I like the old way of doing things. But obviously, when you go into the studio and you record your new record, technologies help to make it easier, no? Of course. It's, it's not always better, but it's the way it is. We are talking today to singer and uh, songwriter Stephen Munar and I would like to ask you Stephen about the documentary The Miracle Boy uh, yes. directed by uh, Nando Caballero. Yeah. It's about your career and it was premiered at the Inedit Festival in Barcelona. Well, that was a great honor, to be honest, no? Um, Nando Caballero is a good friend of mine and he released two of my records in, in it was 2010 and 2011, so I always have a good and a close relationship. So uh, when my previous band, the Tea Servants, we decided to make some concerts um, just to you know, remember some of our old stuff, we were talking and he decided that it would be nice to record the concert. But after that, the thing got a bit long, longer and we decided to just to make a, a, a real documentary on all my career and all, all the steps that I've done. Mm -hmm. I see. How did it feel when you saw your work on the big screen? It was weird because <laughs> I, I was surrounded by friends and family and, you know, all the time talking about you was, oh Christ, that's vanity what we were talking about. But, well, I felt very honoured, to be honest. Stephen, tell me when and where are your next gigs? Okay. Uh, the next gig that I'm doing is on the 26th of April, that's in Santa Coloma, right. in El Cinque. And then, uh, to be honest, I don't remember all the dates I've got, but I've got a, a summer. We're playing in Sabade in July, the 22nd of July in La Capella. We're also doing one in September in La Pobla de Segur. I don't know, I, and I've got, I, I do know that I've got some in between, but I can't okay, remember Well, now. we'll check your website. Yes, that's the best place. And if I may correct you, uh, Stephen, your next gig is uh, in this show because you're going to sing. Uh, that's true. <laughs> what are you going to sing and who um, uh, is playing with you? Okay, we're going to sing Stillness, which is the third song of 
from the LP, and right. it's our first single. Mm -hmm. and is the one uh, dedicated to your father? Yes, it's the one dedicated to my father. And the Miracle Band will be playing with me with Sergio Mesa on bass and Patricia Serrano on the guitar. Mm -hmm. Well, looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Stephen Munar. Thank you very much to you. And as Stephen and his friends get ready to sing uh, on our stage, I suggest you pay attention to the next episode of our tips. This time, phrasal verbs related to love. Here they are. Today, we're giving tips about love. But I'm here to talk about the other side of love. What happens when a relationship ends? Yes, you'll probably be sad. But how do you explain the process you've just been through? There are two main ways to referring to the end of a romantic relationship. The first one is the breakup. You break a relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Or you split up, which means you divide the unit into two. My girlfriend and I have just split up. And I can add to this dramatically by saying, and I'm finally through with her, as if I've just been through a long desert without a single drop of water. I'm finally through. I could say the same thing by saying, we are finished. And of course I mean as a couple, because we would both go our separate ways with very little common future. A breakup could go in many ways, but if you want to avoid confrontation and prolonged argument, you can make a clean break, which means you separate yourself from the relationship completely with the plan of never returning. With the spread of social media, this has led to ghosting. Ghosting refers to ignoring all forms of communication on all apps or digital platforms. If somebody wants to end a relationship with you, they will be dumping you or you will dump them. Like my sister, Sarah. She dumped her boyfriend, Jim, the other week. If this happens to you, don't worry, hang in there. You'll get through it. Keep the words in mind of the famous poet, Alfred Tennyson. It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Goodbye. The Dialectical Duel returns to the Weekly Mag. In short, Matthew Tree and Patricia Scalona will meet at our face-off. I still can hear your lament rise All the ways to torture He taught me that The twisted fortune I'm gonna escape from that My old man My old man A drop of mercy Everybody deserves that Even the joker Even the brat Dark must have frightened me Yeah, I can see through your vanity Fire. All your rags were gone Have you forgiven your mother? Or are you yet the stillborn? Come on Dark mask, don't frighten me I can see through your banner
to put you there. I want you far. I still can hear your lament rise. Come on. As you already know by now, Every 23rd of April, Catalonia celebrates its equivalent of St. Valentine's Day, which is also its biggest book festival. People give roses and books to their loved ones and almost everybody thinks it's a special, unusual and wonderful event. Except, of course, for Matthew Tree. Matthew, tell me, what do you have against San Jordi this time? Everybody likes San Jordi, no? Well, yeah, that's one of the problems. It's like everybody has to like it. And maybe that's one of the reasons I don't like it. It's like re in recent years, I've got the idea that it's become a sort of, sort of, in part at least, fake festival in the sense that all the book stands on San Jordi sell more or less the same titles. Uh, all these are titles which have been heavily promoted or tipped off to be the best sellers for San Jordi. So you've got this kind of uh, spiral in which the same books are sold all the time in the same stalls because they've been promoted. And that means that all the new books that are brought out, dozens and dozens and dozens of titles, simply disappear from view because San Jordi buries these new titles. So I think it's actually becoming something a bit negative even for the book industry. Well, Matthew, this is your opinion, but I'm sure that our guest today doesn't think that way. Patricia Scalona has been a publisher for the whole of her professional life. She has worked for three different publishers here and also in New York, and she is now a freelance. Uh, she has published just about every kind of books, from uh, noir novels to feminist uh, non-fiction. Patricia, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank you very much. Uh, tell me, what do you think about uh, Matthew's uh, view about San Jordi? Well, I don't agree at all. <laughs> I think it's a great day and it's a great day for, our, for us professionals and for the people who like to read and also for the people who are not used to go and buy books because that's their chance, the books come to them and for the first time in many, many, many days probably um, they have a choice and they have uh, the opportunity to go and seek out titles that yeah might have been um, heavily promoted but also I think if you don't find different titles and different books, you're being lazy because there's everything out there. Literary fiction and less known authors and everything you can look for, so... It's hard to disagree, yeah? <laughs> it's hard to disagree. Not, not for me it isn't. No, no, I don't have any problem at all with that. No, because uh, you talked about uh, publishers, booksellers, people in the business and you talked about readers, but you left out the writers who are the people we actually create the books, you know. And uh, like one of the problems on, on I found in recent San Jordi's days is that we know that 44% of the Catalan population doesn't read, which means they do not read one book per year. That's the sort of minimum established figure. So that means that on San Jordi, when it's obligatory to buy a book and they have really no criteria as to how to choose a book, they simply go for the ones which are prize winners or which have been promoted on TV or which have been written by people who appear on TV. And so you get this, this whole sort of mass of books being sold 
uh, which sort of function and for one year, but then all these uh, other titles uh, sort of disappear. And the, I've, I've had the experience as both someone buying books and someone sitting behind the table trying to sell his own books, that you get this situation where you've got seven writers behind the table. One of them is one of the famous writers or tipped writers or media famous writers like and so forth. Writer. Celebrity writers, thank you, that's the exact word. And all the others just get bypassed because 44% uh, of those people who are out there uh, for San Jordi are people who normally never never buy books. So it, it becomes kind of confusing for the, I don't know, I find it a little weird. But I think you're talking about two different things there. You're talking about signing books or you're talking about selling books? You're talking about signing books. You find yourself in a group of people who are signing books and yeah, of course okay. the celebrity mm. authors are going to have much more opportunity of signing books because they're well known. They're on the radio, they're on TV, they're on the magazines. But, um, and you guys who are not as well known are going to have a much harder time actually getting to sign books. As for the people who have no criteria, I don't <coughs> quite agree with that. People might not have a criteria, a criteria as to what to buy, but I can assure you as a person who has been selling books as well, not as, a, as an author, but as a, as a publisher, as an editor, selling the books that I have published, they do ask. People come to the stalls and they do ask. Um, whatever. My daughter is 20 years old and mm -hmm. what does she like? Um, she is, I don't know, a feminist. Good, I've got the book for you. They do ask and they do uh, want you to lead the way for them. And as far as I'm concerned, if 20 people end up reading books that year and they hadn't before, um, our job is done there. Just with those, those 20 Just people? Just with those 20 no, more don't, readers don't that we might wrong. get. I'm, I'm not suggesting that the 44% who don't read a book are idiots. No, no, no. Uh, I, I'm just not. saying no, that no. they, it's normal, it's logical that I they do don't, agree with they, that. they ask questions, as you said, you know, my daughter needs this, blah, blah, blah. So if we go to the other extreme, which are readers who do read regularly and specifically want a book, and they know it's come out for San Jordi because uh, I don't know the percentage, but a very large number of titles are, are published before San Jordi. Now, suppose they go to a standard stall on San Jordi's day and they say, I want. Uh, such and such title by such and such completely unknown author by such and such little publisher, the chances are they won't be able to find it on, on San Jordi's day. Uh -huh. But those people wouldn't do that. Those people would go to exactly the place where they want to go to get such and such, such author. If it's minori if you have a minority author, they're going to try and find the bookshop uh, where it sells, or the stall of the publishing house, or if they know what they want, they will go for it. They will go for it. I say it because I've had the experience <laughs> of, of uh, asking people, uh, because also on San Jordi, it's, uh, uh, as I'm sure you've been commenting on the, earlier on the program, it's, it's a romantic festival, and the book forms part of that romantic festival. So right. people ask their loved ones, what would you like me to get? And I always, in the past, I, what I've done is I've said, I want that title by that little known author, blah, blah, blah. And of course, I never get it because they can't, they can't find it. Uh, but I take your point. Yes, if they, they can, they can go to the right place. If, if so, Matthew, if they do you know buy it. do you buy books for San Jordi? No, never, never. Roses. Roses, yes. Yes. Yeah, because uh, for me, San Jordi. But that's for many years. I've never, never bought a a, a book on on San Jordi's day, precisely because I feel it's the one of the worst days to really choose a book. You know, the best way to choose a book is when you go to a bookshop even if you don't know what you want, but you can just look and you have this huge variety of titles and you'll find something interesting. And, but on San Jordi's day, you know, you, it's, you don't have a, as big a, a variety. But the roses side of things, I, I like. Yeah, the, uh, I always buy roses. Well, that's because my family actually get angry if I don't <laughs> buy the roses. It's quite right, so basically, Matthew, you think that San Jordi has become a victim or is becoming a victim of its own success in a way? Let, let's say there's a, a danger of it. There are years when it's not so much like that and years when it's, you really think, whoa, 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 maybe we should be doing something here to stop this becoming a kind of circus. Uh, because some days, some years, San Jordi has been like a kind of circus. Uh, this year, funnily enough, with the quality of the new books coming out and stuff, there's a lot of new stuff that's very interesting. Maybe it won't happen this year, but I do feel uh, 
there should be a little bit of self-criticism about San Jordi because there is this thing, it's such a wonderful day, it's such an amazing event. And okay, it is, it's unique in Europe and so forth, perhaps in the world. But um, uh, I really think there should be some self-criticism, both from, from booksellers, from publishers, uh, from authors themselves, maybe. Mm -hmm. Patricia? Um, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> you have the right to disagree. Um, you have a 10% discount, which is the only day in the year the law allows for that, because the book in Spain has a fixed price, um, which is a difference that we have with other countries. The UK, for example, doesn't have that. Um, and I think uh, we might do some criticism, but you can live your San Jordi the way you want. I mean, you're not obliged to go down to the Ramblas or down to Passage da Gracia. You can stay in your neighborhood. There will be bookstalls there. You will be able to talk to your bookseller. You will be able to browse and to choose and to pick as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Plus, you will have more variety because, as you were saying, um, there's a lot more to offer in offer uh, the day of San Jordi because publishers and editors have put out everything that they have, all the big guns. Mm -hmm. So. I don't see what's the problem here, really. Well, I think, um, I think, um, I think uh, Patricia is being really convincing, yeah? Um, and I'm sorry, I know that this is like um, repeating itself now. Uh, it's the but third I, time, yeah. I know, but I must confess I really like San Jordi. I'm a fan. Um, I think it's a great day, enjoyable and entertaining. And uh, today I, um, I'm on Patricia's part as well. I'm on her side, I mean. Uh, yeah, but I, anyway, tried, you know. <laughs> come with me. Anyway, um, come walk the streets with me. Anyway, thank you for, for coming. Uh, I'll see you next week uh, in the same place, same time. Same time. Right? But Patricia, thank, thank you so much for, uh, for coming. Thanks and for uh, good luck with the sales. Thanks. Okay, but anyway, I don't want you to leave upset, so I have two roses here, one for each. Thank you thank for you. coming. See you next week. Thank you. And thank very you, Patricia. Much. Thank you. And I hope you have great sales for, for Sancho this, this year. You can stay up to date with everything related to this show through our Twitter and Facebook. There you will find pictures, videos, and all of our tips. And as you know, we like to finish the program with a thought related to the main topic of this show, which is love. Our farewell quote today is from the most famous physicist in history. Albert Einstein, whose experiences in the field of love were also intense. Goodbye.